Gonzalo Lira in the early stages of the war in Ukraine brought us first-hand testimony literally from the streets of Kharkov where the bombs and the missiles and the tank fire and the artillery shelling was actually audible in the background to the commentary he was given. He's in a much safer place now, but he's still very close to the action. And above all, he's got his ear to the ground and his eye on what might be the prize. The prize being the end of this carnage on both sides. And he joins me now. Gonzalo, thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us. I hope you can hear me. I can no longer see you on my screen. Uh, but if you can hear me, please... Uh, take from me the salutation of our entire audience that was very worried about you for quite some considerable time and are delighted to see you alive and well now. Please accept my uh, warmest uh, greetings and turn, if you will, to the warning that you gave just this week that the Americans themselves are preparing to ditch President Zelensky. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. And I'm a great admirer of you, George, and I will always be very thankful for, for you and all you've done for me. And, and you know what I'm talking about. So thank you. Now, insofar as the current situation in, in uh, Ukraine is concerned, well, um, it, it's, it's, it's so typical of the Americans, unfortunately, of the American uh, foreign policy establishment. They use people, and when their usefulness is over, they throw them away in the most despicable and callous way imaginable. Now, it, it seems very clear that the war in Ukraine is going very, very badly for the Ukrainian armed forces. This is not to question the heroism or bravery of the men or their efforts. On the contrary, the fact that they've lasted so long uh, before the Russian onslaught is a testament to their bravery. But the fact is, and this is something that was obvious from the very beginning of this war, the Russian army is simply bigger, better prepared, better equipped, better led, both militarily and politically. And so they are winning. They are winning decisively. Now, we are coming to the end of the Battle of the Donbass. At this time, the Russian army has chewed through all of the fortifications that the Ukrainian armed forces had developed over the past eight years. And they are about to hit the uh, Kramatorsk line, which is the last line of this battle, because it's been a series of lines uh, that protect uh, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces and that have held back the Russians. And the Russians have been relentlessly chewing through these lines and they're getting to the last one. And of course, by this point, the Ukrainian armed forces have been uh, uh, denigrated by the onslaught of the Russian armed forces. And the Russian armed forces are fresh and tidy and, and looking very good and very crisp because they're constantly rotated. Uh, you know, sometimes the, the, uh, the Russians will put in a unit for barely a day of combat and then pull them out and replace them with fresh troops. And so uh, th this, of course, means that the Russians always have fresh, rested, well-equipped troops confronting a very weary, very exhausted Ukrainian armed force. And so the, the inevitability is arriving, which is the complete collapse of the Ukrainian armed forces, which I want to insist... It, it, it is not uh, me uh, uh, besmirching in any way or belittling in any way the efforts of the Ukrainian armed forces. It's just the reality on the ground. The Russians are winning. Anybody who says otherwise is just fooling themselves. The HIMARS, which are these uh, multiple, ro uh, multiple rocket launch systems that everybody keeps talking about, this is uh, wonder weapon, you know, pie in the sky thinking. Uh, the, the number of HIMARS being sent to the Ukraine front are just minimal, trivial. They've sent 20. What the Ukrainians would actually need to be combat effective is maybe 10 times, maybe 15 times that number. I'm talking 200 to 300 high Mars, not 20. And on top of that, of the 20 that they've sent, the Russians have definitively destroyed at least four and possibly from accounts an additional two more as of today. It doesn't really matter. The truth is that the Russians are winning. And so what's going to happen is that, see, it, there will come a, a tipping point in this conflict where the Ukrainian armed forces will simply collapse. And when that happens, the Russian armed forces will sweep westward 
from the Donbass, from the Kherson area, they will sweep westward. Uh, the Donbass area, they will sweep towards uh, Dnipropetrovsk, which is a center, which is a city rather. In when you're looking at the map of Ukraine, it's dead center. Uh, the Russians will sweep towards that city, and they will probably overrun it. It's the third largest city in in Ukraine. And in Kherson to the south, which is just north of the Crimean Peninsula, they will probably attack Nikolaev and sweep westward towards Transnistria. Uh, they will probably ignore Odessa because Odessa is a historically and for religious reasons, a very important city to the Russians. And it's already been clear the Russians have telegraphed their intention of taking Odessa one way or the other. But it is unlikely that they will carry out an assault on the city because they don't want to damage it because of the historical importance that the city has. And so what they'll probably do is simply surround it. They will make a dash for Transnistria, cut off Odessa from the north, from Kiev, and just wait it out because time is on the Russian side. And so what has been increasingly clear is that the West is realizing two things. Number one, they're realizing that NATO cannot match the Russians. The Russians, in terms of their industrial output, in terms of the amount of artillery pieces and munitions, they simply outclass the West. And this has been clear by, uh, this has been pointed out rather, by Western think tanks. The Western think tanks of the um, Royal uh, Unified Society Institute, which is like, a, like the military think tank of Great Britain, there was a very interesting article called The Return of Industrial Warfare, where it was basically pointed out that the West, because of its deindustrialization policies of the last 30 years, which has hurt the working classes of the West so badly, well, precisely because of this deindustrialization, the West does not have the industry to arm its uh, armies, uh, forgive the malapropism. And so, therefore, the West cannot simply cannot compete if they were to go in a head-to-head -head war with the Russians, they would run out of ammunition. The West would run out of ammunition in about two months with no possibility of resupply. Uh, the famous uh, saying by Stalin that uh, quantity has a quality all its own. It's very true of the current situation of the current conflict. <clears throat> and so NATO, the West, is realizing they cannot compete, fight against the Russians, so they won't. And the war is lost. And so it seems increasingly clear that the position of uh, Zelensky in Kiev is becoming untenable. There have already been signs <coughs> excuse me, um, that, that his position is weakening with the West. And so I think what will happen is that the West will begin to slowly withdraw its support in terms of money, in terms of equipment. <coughs> Please excuse me. Um, inflation here is rising, and you can see it in the exchange rate between the hryvnia, which is the Ukrainian currency, and the dollar and the euro. Uh, it's fallen 10% in the last three days. Um, three days ago, you could uh, buy a dollar for uh, 37 and a half to 38 hryvnias, and now it's at 41 and a half. So basically, about uh, almost 10% in three days. Uh, which means, of course, that the Ukraine government, the Zelensky regime, is not getting the foreign currency necessary to keep the government of Ukraine afloat. And so, you know, it, it, these are various signs that are showing that the West is withdrawing its support. And the um, National Security Advisor of the United States, a man named Jacob Sullivan, a man of extraordinary incompetence and stupidity, quite frankly, well, <clears throat> he has stated publicly that Zelensky should be concerned about his personal safety. He is, Jake Sullivan is basically telegraphing the fact that the, um, that the Americans are thinking of physically getting rid of Zelensky. And of course, they're couching it in the language that the Russians are going to do something to Zelensky which has been a common pattern of the Western uh, military political establishment, whereby they will often say that the Russians are planning to do something when it's in fact what they themselves are thinking of doing, and they're projecting it onto the Russians. This is a very common thing that uh, people have noticed over the last year or so, 
where the Americans, the Europeans are thinking of something and they project it onto the Russians when they themselves are the ones who are planning such a thing. I think that that's why I believe well, uh, and I've said that, so publicly. That, that, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, you did say so publicly. I want to test. Uh, I want to test that. It's worth the audience remembering that Zelensky is a Russian-speaking Ukrainian. He actually yeah. his Ukrainian language is not that good. Uh, his no. native tongue is Russian. Number two, uh, that Zelensky was elected on a peace platform. He was elected <laughs> to make peace with Russia. Uh, and thirdly, of course. I want to test your proposition because, of course, the Americans, sure. as the DM brothers uh, could testify if the Americans hadn't uh, had them rubbed out in Vietnam, you can be uh, useful for America for a time and then you can be killed. Uh, the, uh, the, the Americans could kill Zelensky, the Russians could kill Zelensky, but much more likely is that people within his own regime would kill him, either so that they could fill their pockets in the way that Zelensky has filled his, or because they have some vision that the war can be won differently uh, from that pursued by Zelensky. Explore those three mm -hmm. possibilities, if you would. Sure. Number one, it's never going to be the Russians, because the Russians, as many commentators have pointed out, they need Zelensky to be the one to sign the peace agreement, the ceasefire agreement. Because the Russians see that eventually some ceasefire will have to be signed. And since uh, Zelensky has so much, uh, so many people have validated Zelensky as the legitimate leader of Ukraine, the Russians need to have Zelensky sign that ceasefire agreement. If the Russians wanted to kill Zelensky, and, and I'm not saying anything that people don't know, uh, uh, they could have killed him on the first day of the special military operation. It would have been no trick at all because they know exactly where he is uh, pretty much at all times because of their intelligence, both human intelligence and signal intelligence. For the Russians, it would be no trick to kill Zelensky if they wanted to. The fact that he's alive means that the Russians want him alive. And it's very clear why, because they want him to be the man to sign the peace agreement. So it's not the Russians. Now, insofar as any internal coup any internal coup that takes place to get rid of Zelensky and replace him would have to have the okay of the United States, not the Europeans. The Europeans are the chihuahuas in this story, okay? The big dog are the <laughs> Americans, the people in the Pentagon and Foggy Bottom. The Foggy Bottom is where the State Department is. Well, those people are the ones who are supporting Zelensky. And any coup attempt against Zelensky would have to have the okay of the big dogs back in Washington. And so uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, there is certainly a lot of palace intrigue and there've been a lot of moves as of late of people getting replaced and then not replaced, you know, fired and not fired. I'm talking specifically about the head of the SBU, the, the Ukrainian State Security Services, which uh, the head of it was a childhood friend of Zelensky's and he was fired by Zelensky. But then the next day, Zelensky walked it back and said, no, he wasn't fired. He was just suspended. You know, that, that kind of palace intrigue, we will never know the truth. And trying to read the tea leaves and figure out what's going on there, it, it's a fool's errand because it, it, there are too many variables. We don't know what's really going on. All we can see are what the Americans are saying. And that is much more clear. And when the Americans put out a signal that Zelensky should watch himself, that the Russians want to kill him, that's because the Americans are thinking that. See, the Russians have no interest in, in uh, getting rid of Zelensky because it would cause for the Russians many more problems, whereas the Americans might be thinking along the following lines. They might be thinking, look, Ukraine is lost if we have Zelensky and his military leadership killed in a missile strike that we ourselves do carry out as we've done with other regimes. If we do it and we blame the Russians and we get the Western press on board with this story and blame it all on the Russians and we punt the entire Ukraine nation onto Russia's lap, a, a decapitated nation with no president, no military leadership, and all of a sudden, all of these soldiers, all of them armed, 
you have chaos, civil chaos, like a situation that happened in Libya. And we punt this whole problem into the lap of the Russians. Well, now that would solve a lot of America's problems very neatly now, wouldn't it? Because it would effectively become a huge problem for the Russians logistically to bring some sort of civil order to the Ukrainian nation. Do recall, Ukraine is the size of France, the size of Texas. It's enormous. It's an enormous piece of country. So to occupy it, to pacify it, you would need at least a quarter of a million soldiers, if not more. And I'm, I'm talking just soldiers just to be policing the place, not, not like a war, just to, to keep social order, okay? And so the Americans, it, would, it seems realistic to me with these comments made by Jake Sullivan, it seems realistic to think that they are uh, entertaining the idea of assassinating Zelensky and his military leadership, blame it on the Russians, cause, deliberately cause, all kinds of civil unrest and anarchy within Ukraine and have this become a permanent problem for Russia. They did something essentially similar in Libya, whereby they um, manufactured the killing of Gaddafi and turned Libya into a complete basket case. I mean, you know, we, we, in the end of it, we literally have slave trading going on in the streets of Tripoli, for crying out loud. And, and all of Libya is just, uh, you know, divided up between various warlords that are constantly fighting one another in complete chaos, right? And we have the Syrian situation where the Americans have done their utmost to create civil unrest uh, and civil chaos, because ultimately the United States is the empire of chaos, where chaos rules because chaos benefits the United States. So that kind of gameplay seems reasonable it, that, that kind of 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 approach which in fact has happened just now in sri lanka where the americans the american ngos non-governmental organizations all these green non-governmental organizations created the conditions where now you have civil chaos in sri lanka and soon you are going to have famines in sri lanka you know a complete catastrophe but this plays into the geostrategic goals of the United States, because instead of trying to raise up the United States, they find it more convenient to pull everybody down. And that seems to me why it's, it's reasonable to think at this time, things can change, of course, but it's reasonable to think that the Americans are the ones planning to get rid of Zelensky, blame it on the Russians, and let Ukraine or even push Ukraine into total civil chaos. Gonzalo Lira, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Stay safe and stay Thank in touch. Thank you so much. And we'll see you again soon, uh, I hope.